All right, good morning. We're going to get started here, so I'm going to just open us up in prayer real quick. Father, we just thank you for today, God. God, we just ask that you would come and be in this place with us, Father. Lord, we open up our hearts to you, Father, to receive from you today. God, as we enter into worship, we pray, God, that your presence, God, that it would uh, dwell um, on us, among us, Father, and in us, Father. Lord, we just, uh, God, we thank you for the things that you are doing in this body as a whole, Father. And God, we just ask, Lord, that we would continue to search for you. We would continue to be expectant to see you move, to see you do things in our lives, Father. God, that we would look for the evidence of you. And Lord, we just thank you for that, God. And we just ask that you would just bless this service today, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.
to Calvary, where Jesus bled.
to fall upon their knees. You're the one who welcomes sinners, and you open blinded eyes. You restored the broken hearted, and you brought the dead to life.
it's all heaven's mercy see. sing it again
You know, last week, uh, the Lord was saying something about shaking hell, and I guess what I was getting today, it was kind of funny this morning when, uh, you know, the worship team was kind of talking and Joe was talking with them, I don't remember exactly how it was said, but Joe said, I'm not known for being quiet. And that kind of stuck with me, and I felt like Jesus asked me, Leland, are you quiet all week? because we we come here and and sometimes God's really pouring out in worship and and we're in a, in a sense attacking the gates of hell but through the week do we forget who we are do we forget that we are on the offense do we just kind of float through the week to, to get to the next Sunday or are we continually passionately pounding the gates of hell it's not a Sunday morning thing. Tonight we're going to be doing worship. It's not a Sunday night thing. It's 24-7. Is that what we're doing? You know, I felt like, uh, no, this isn't biblical. It's just kind of like a picture I got during worship was, you know, if you remember playing tag when you're a kid, you know, running around, there's always a base somewhere. You know, you can touch the base as long as you're touching it, you can't get tagged. Well, if you can picture that, that's, that's kind of the, you know, see, the body of Christ doesn't function in gates. Uh, the body of Satan, they, they function in gates. We don't. So, you know, when it's talking about hell and the gates of hell, see, that, that's his safe place. But all week long, yeah, we're not here pounding the gates of hell and shaking it Sunday mornings. We're doing it all week. He might be in his safe place somewhat, but, you know, we're going to stand outside the gates and throw some dynamite over the walls just to let them know, hey, the Church of Christ is still here and you will stay in your place. That's what we're called to do. So, Father, as we come this morning, God, we thank you. Lord, it's not us. Father, it's you. Father, it's not our power that attacks the gates of hell. Yeah, we're there with you, but Father, your enforcer, the Holy Spirit in us, Father, that's where the strength lies. Jesus, we never, we never take credit for anything. It's all you. But your church is to trample on the snakes and scorpions. And Father, we will not forget that. And Father, just like Joe said this morning, I am not known for being quiet. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Father, we thank you. We praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, good morning, everybody. Wow, what an awesome worship. I, uh, I'm going to throw some dynamite here <laughs> in just a little bit. But uh, first of all, I want to get a couple of announcements out there. Leyland already mentioned that we're doing the Sunday night worship tonight at 7 o'clock here. So come and bring a friend if you want. Uh, an hour, hour and 15 minutes of worship and uh, an encouraging uh, a word, a short a short encouraging word. I also want to remind everyone uh, on August 15th, if you haven't been baptized, come and see me uh, here in the next week or, or so. And uh, we're going to do some water baptisms on August 15th. And that will be done around noontime. I'll give you, uh, we'll give more of the specifics coming up. But if you haven't been baptized, come and see me uh, if it's something that you'd like to do. Also want to remind everyone this vase on the table that's sitting off here to the side, that is our benevolence for the Dunbar School. And so we're going to be, we're literally getting, it's going to be like near a truckload of supplies for the school. And we know that uh, school is fixing to start. And of course, 
this school year is bringing a lot of, uh, right, it, it, just because of the season that we're in, there's challenges to the school. And so I reached out uh, to the school and they sent me an email back of a list of things that they would be uh, just, you know, they said we're so appreciative if, if even just one thing on the list was, uh, was handled, we're going to take care of the entire list. And so uh, drop some money. If you want to donate to that, just drop it into that vase. Every single penny that goes into that vase is going to go to the Dunbar School. And then um, <clears throat> I also want to remind the ladies, women's Bible study, they had a week off, but this uh, Saturday morning at 10 a.m., firing it back up with the book of Philippians, right? And so, uh, ladies, uh, 10 a.m. Saturday, uh, you come, it's right here and uh, for the uh, for the women's Bible study, and you can check out gechurch.com for any of the other stuff. Also, I I caught a rumor that there was a birthday out there today. Maybe Jennifer. Am I am I right? Well, since we're in the church, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Facebook birthday is not the same day as my real birthday. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, all right, so, um, okay, so, in, in a few days, all right, so happy birthday. Uh, okay, if you, uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Psalm 119, We're get, it's going to be a little bit before we get there, so you can literally, you can open it and then use your Bible as your notepad for... Uh, if you if you're going to take some notes, uh, and I know that of course most everyone opens their Bible by click clicking their phone. Uh, so I, I'll open by saying um, I'll give you a little a backdrop to today's message. Uh, t today's mes message is uh, I am building it around. Um, the parents that have kids that are not walking with the Lord, as they should. Not, not just for like kids that are way out there, but I'm, I'm, I'm building it around that because of a couple reasons. Over the last uh, couple weeks, I've had several conversations uh, where with parents that are just, they're contending, they're pressing, they're praying, they're contending, uh, for their kids to walk in a fullness of the identity that Christ has for them. And so I am building this message around that, um, but it doesn't only pertain to that. So if you're one of the young adults that's not married, not even have a boyfriend or girlfriend or something, uh, you don't get to zone out. Because we're going to talk about principles and praying uh, that are effective and essential for every area of prayer or most every area of prayer. So it's not like, uh, you know, you get to just take the week off. But myself, I'm building it around, uh, you know, our, for the parents, the kids that have uh, aren't walking with Lord like they should. This week, it, it all came about uh, while I was sitting at my desk, and I was just, you know, throughout the week, I'll listen to uh, pastors, pastors and, and preachers that I like to listen to that I, uh, you know, that feed me. And so I was listening to an old rerun of probably 15 years ago of a guy preaching a message, and in it, he began to give the testimony of his daughter and that testimony that he was sharing at the time was probably uh, 10 or 15 years old. So, I mean, this is something that, this is a testimony that had happened maybe 25 years from now, you know, previously. But as he was sharing the testimony of his daughter, uh, just like in the middle of it, as he was talking, I like, I'm just going to, I'm just making myself vulnerable <laughs> here to you guys. I literally just like burst out in weeping for about 10 or 15 seconds. And then I, I got a hold of myself and I was like, God, what was that? That was out of 
out of play. I mean, as I get older and the closer I get with God, I definitely am a softer, more compassionate person. I mean, I, I catch myself tearing up in cartoons sometimes. I mean, it's like <laughs> I'm definitely getting soft, more and more soft over the years. But that was just out of, out of context, out of place for me to just like burst out in uncontrollable weeping for a little bit. And and so I knew that it wasn't just my flesh, that it was it was my spirit or the Holy Spirit in me and my there was something going on. And I and I didn't necessarily completely understand it. So I just was praying, okay, God, what do you want to say here? Because there's something about the testimony of a child that was lost being found and, and coming back into the family that just stirred the spirit in a moment. And, and of course, uh, you know, we all know this. It's the same spirit that's in me that's in you, the Holy Spirit. I mean, we are, we are a spirit. We have our own, you know, we're our own person. But when God comes to dwell in us, it's the same Holy Spirit that's in me that's in you, right? Well, if that's the case, it's also the same Holy Spirit that, you know, was in the Bible times doing things. In the, so the same Holy Spirit that was active in this guy's testimony of his daughter and her life. And so, and so as 25 years later, as I'm watching this, the same Holy Spirit that's in me was the one doing the work on that day that you know that reconciled that 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 daughter and so he remembers it obviously quite well <laughs> and so we forget about that sometimes so um so i so i spent uh, a lot of time this week just praying and kind of digging into that and just literally like starting to search the scriptures about kids and children and stuff like that and and so anyways, that's the backdrop. I I've, I've basically have built the message around that moment uh, and, and allowing God, okay, God, speak to me in this and show me what it is that you, you want to do. Here's where I ended up. I feel like we need to remind God sometimes about our kids. And you might be thinking, <laughs> that's a sketchy statement. Uh, <laughs> I'll... Uh, Stick with me for a little bit, and and you'll understand. But my uh, my intention is to to get your intent uh, attention here. So today, the title of the message is "Reminding God," um, and we are going to talk about reminding God about our kids and reminding God about other things. I'm going to first, before we really get into that, I'm going to talk about faith. Just n not for long here, but we're going to talk about the lifespan of faith as it pertains to us. I'm going to talk about the beginning, where it comes from. I'm going to talk about what activates it, and I'm going to talk about its completion real quick. So, number one, you can write this down. Number one, faith comes from God. It didn't. Uh, I don't exalt people when I see them, and it, and it appears to me like they have great faith, and their faith accomplishes a lot. Uh, I I am I think that's awesome, but I don't exalt them, and I certainly don't exalt myself when I see someone struggling in the realm of faith, and I think to myself, man, that wouldn't be a problem uh, for me to believe in this area. I don't I don't exalt myself. I don't you know don't you know get a big head. I don't think you guys do too. Um, Romans twelve three says to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but Think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So we don't exalt people because faith, and we don't get exalted because of faith. Faith comes from God. Faith, when we talk about faith, I think a, a good way to look at it is faith always is in the realm of God. It's, it's, it's something you participate in, but it's never pointed at you. It never praises you, should never cause you to be pray. It, faith is only effective and applicable in the realm of God. And so 
Number one, faith comes from God. He's dealt to each the measure of faith. It, it didn't start here. It started with him, but it came here. Num point number two, faith is voice activated. And it's voice activated, I'll say it like this. It's voice activated by God and God alone. Faith is not activated by your voice. It's activated by his voice. And this, is, this might be a little... Uh, Maybe a little uh, strange for me to, you know, to say it like this. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. Uh, I'll say it like this. Of course, it's voice activated by God. If you were to create something and, it, and you were to make it voice activated, wouldn't you like make it your own voice? If, if you were going to have something voice activated, my watch is voice activated. Right? I can ask my watch what the weather is and what the time is and what the date is. But if Quinn were to come over and talk to my watch, it's not going to recognize her voice. Now, I didn't create the watch, but I programmed it to my voice. Right? So when, when God creates something and, and he, he makes it where it's going to respond and it's going to be effective in people's lives... Uh, but it's, it's voice activated. It's going to be his voice. It's going to be his words that activate it, not ours. This is the whole reason, like the whole, uh, and some of you have been around long enough to know that late 80s and 90s and stuff, when you had the whole move into the name it, claim it doctrine, the na you know, the whole uh, speaking into existence. Well, that, that never really worked that well because it's just not activated by someone's words. It's activated by his word. Um, so uh, in uh, Romans ten seventeen, it says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Not just hearing anything, but it comes by, it's activated, it comes alive by hearing the word of God. And so there's three manifestations of the word. You know this, I'm going to talk about them briefly here. The spoken word, the saving word, the scripted word. So the spoken, the spoken word, Matthew 17, 5, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And John 1, 4 talks about the saving word, 1, 14, I should say, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The saving word is Jesus. It's the word in the flesh. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we have this saving word that's in Jesus Christ, that is Jesus Christ. And then we have the, scritten, the scripted word, that written word that's in many of your hands. It says in John uh, 10, 35, to, this is Jesus speaking, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture can't be broken. So Jesus calls the word of God scripture and the scripture the word of God. And so we have the spoken word, we have the saving word, we have the written word. Uh, any of these three words activate faith and allow it to come alive. But it has to be one of these three words. So w uh, when we're going to be praying and standing in faith for something... What do we need to be connected with? Not your hopes, not your intentions, not what you think would be a great idea for someone in their life. You have to be relating it to the Word of God because the Word is going to allow faith to come alive in your, in your heart and, and you're going to be able to stand in faith over or in or with whatever it is. And so in Acts 2, 37, it says... Uh, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, this is when Peter, after the day of Pentecost, he's preaching, and, and you know, the people had thought, oh, these guys are all drunk. All these people are drunk because they, they're, they're getting kind of crazy. Uh, and Peter responds, and he, he gives them a message, but he says... Uh, let the whole house of Israel know that assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. How, how many agree? That's the word of God. It's the scripted word of God now, but it was the spoken word of God then through the Holy Spirit in him. And so <clears throat> it says, 
verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Then those, in verse 41 it says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized into the body of Christ. The word stirred the faith that was laying dormant that had been dealt to them but never come alive. And the word activated the faith. They responded. Uh, they were baptized. That's what I mean by the response. They were baptized to express their faith that came alive by the word of God. And so the word of God is required to activate faith in someone's life or in your life. So uh, the third part here, talking about the completion of faith, faith pleases God. God's not pleased when we do it our own way or in our own time. Faith is deposited by God, activated by God, and required to please God. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must first believe that He is, and that He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Now, probably many of you, when I said faith is required to please Him, you immediately thought in your mind, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Most of us know that verse. Most of us can't quote the verse to the end because of this first part. It's without faith, it's impossible to please him. Yes, but look at it in context. I'll read it again. It says, for he who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So when you're, when you're looking at it in its entirety, to, it's a, it's a, I would say it's, it's a partial truth according to context to say without faith it's impossible to please him. It takes faith to please God. Yes, we do. But God doesn't leave it there. Without it, it's impossible to please him. If you please him by having faith, then he is, then he is the rewarder of that. Not, not like questionable, not like part of the time. This is the word of God. He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him by faith. God is, uh, he's not in a box. He is sovereign, the ruler, so don't make a whole doctrine out of this, but, but I would go as far as to say that he's, he's bound by his character. He's not bound by your thought or your opinion, but it's almost like his character binds him because of love that if you, you have our, that faith is coming alive in you and you diligently seek him, it's like he's bound because of his love in his character. I will bless him. I, that pleases me. I will respond. I, I'm not going igno- to, I can't ignore it. I can't. I just can't ignore my kids who seek me by faith. The very thing I deposited th- in them to make that even possible. I gave them the tools. They're using it. I get to respond. And so I would, I, I would say that joy isn't cultivated in the heart of God by ignoring his kids. Sometimes we get to thinking to where it's like, oh, I pray and I pray and I pray and nothing happened. I don't know if God even hears me. Uh, the only question, maybe the two questions I would have is is there faith present and then who who if there is then who told you that he doesn't hear you or that he doesn't want to respond who told you that like god said to adam and eve you know in the garden who told you i think the character of god uh causes him to never miss an opportunity to respond and to reward so, uh, here is where, um, I think here is the disconnect. Now, I'm, now that we kind of have a, a, a good a foundational 
perspective here of faith, uh, I want to move into reminding God. (laughs) Here's where we need to remind God. And uh, I'm going to start by saying here's the disconnect. A lot of times our prayers are informative prayers. We're informing God of the situation. We are... I mean, we're we're telling him the names, the illness, the the person's sin, the struggle. We're, I mean, a lot of times when we're talking to God, we're clarifying all this stuff and we're informing him of everything that's going on. My, my, you know, my brothers, cousins, aunts, wife's, you know, I'll na- I just name, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, the illness, the sprained ankle, the bad doctors. We're, we're, we inform God as if he doesn't know already. Um, and that's a great place to start and it's a terrible place to end. So we want to start, we want to start there by informing him of the person. And like I said, I, I'm, I'm personally, I'm going to use this like in the area of, of children that have walked away from the Lord or are just not walking in the fullness of what God desires for them is that when we pray, we want to start, when we're interceding for somebody, we want to start in this area of information, informing God. God, this is what's going on. The reason isn't, we're not reminding him yet. We're informing him. And the reason I say it's a great place to start and a terrible place to end is because in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you, right? You want to release that. You want to inform him because in your informing him, you are releasing the burden. And so you you want to pray this way whenever you're interceding for something. And so, but I want you to remember Naming all those cares, it's good for you to release him because that bonded, that burden that you're carrying, you need to be released of that burden, right? That heaviness, you need to be released, so you need to inform him. But those things are not cultivating faith in your life. They're not activating the faith that's in you. And maybe that faith is dormant, maybe it's not. But it's not activating. Naming the names and all of that doesn't activate faith in your life to press God for victory. What it is doing is releasing the burden. But we want to start there, but we want to end somewhere else. And the place that we want to end is is letting faith arise and take its rightful place in our heart over the situation. And so we start there. Uh, but in fact, I'll say in James 1, 6 or 8, it says, But let him ask in faith, not with doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So when your prayer starts and ends in this realm of information, it's going to toss you all over the place. Because what you'll end up doing is trying to stand on the need. Because it's the only thing you've declared. It's the only place you've gone. It's the only thing that you've allowed to come alive in your your heart is to release a burden, but you've got nothing now. And so what do you typically do? You lay something down at the cross of Jesus, and then you're like... Okay, if you're not going to do anything, let me, uh, uh, I'll take it back, right? That's what we do. We, we lay it down, and we're released of the burden. But if something doesn't become activated, then we end up going back and picking up that burden again. And we're carrying the same burden. Oh, maybe it's an hour later. Maybe it's a day later. Maybe it's a week later. Nothing's happening, God. I mean, what's going on here? It's because faith hasn't been released. <clears throat> so God's word is what activates faith. So praying, if if the Word of God is releasing the faith that we need to make a difference, then anything else, what does that release? At best, it releases the burden, but it doesn't release faith. So... Um, 
Psalms 119. Hopefully you've had plenty of time, I think, to, to go there. <laughs> Psalm 119, verse 49 and verse 50. I'm going to read it here. It says, Remember your word to your servant. This is The psalmist is, is praying this to God. He says, Remember your word to your servant, for you have given me hope. My comfort in suffering is this. Your promises preserve my life. That verse, those two verses say a lot. First of all, he's reminding God, Remember your word. What is it that stirs faith and uh, allows faith to come alive in me? His word. And the psalmist is saying, remember your word. God doesn't need to be reminded of his word, but in reminding him of his word, what am I doing? I'm hearing it myself. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if I'm going to be praying for somebody and I want my faith to be activated toward the situation, I want to release myself of the burden, but then I want faith to come alive. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to remind him of his word and his promise. And by speaking it, I'm hearing it and it's coming alive in me. And so his word is beginning to, to, to become strong and come alive in me as I declare it over the situation. If you're only declaring the situation, then at best you're releasing a burden. But when you declare the word of God over the situation, you're not just releasing his word, you're activating the faith in you to walk in victory for it. And so, uh, remember your word to your servant. Because that word, he says, he says, you have given me hope. You have given me hope because of your promise. Because of your word, I have hope. I don't have, I don't have defeat. I have hope. Hope is the confident expectation of good. It's not like, oh my goodness. I sure hope this works out. The confident expectation of good is the kid at Christmas morning waiting, looking at the gift, and they're like, as soon as you say go, <laughs> it's ma'am. <laughs> That's the confident expectation of good. That is what hope does in your life. So when you release the word in verse, uh, Psalm 119, verse 50, my comfort in suffering is this. You, your promise preserves me, preserves my life. Your promise. So <clears throat> Isaiah, how does this, uh, hopefully you're starting to see this puzzle come together. And there again, concerning concerning lost kids. Uh, Isaiah 62, verse 6 and 7 says, uh, on, and I, I pulled this out of the Good News Translation. Uh, I, loved, <laughs> I love the way this, I have went through 20 or 30 different translations. I love the way the, the Good News Translation says this. Isaiah 62, verse 6 and 7 says, On your walls, Jerusalem, I have placed centuries. So that's another word for watchmen. <clears throat> they must never be silent day or night. They must remind the Lord of his promises and never let him forget them. They must give him no rest until he restores Jerusalem. Our, and, and so as a parent, as a watchman over our family... It says we must, without fail, without rest, continue to chew on our kids until they do what's right. Oh, wait. <laughs> that's, not what this, that's not what it says. It says they must continually remind God of his promises until it becomes reality. Until it becomes my reality. Until he saves Jerusalem, the family, the people right? The family of God. Until he saves him, I must continually remind him of his word. So naturally, I'm thinking, what is his word for our kids? Because, right, we, we want to let faith come alive concerning our kids. So I pulled a, a couple of these for you. Remember, the word of God is the sword for Jesus. It's certainly capable of being your sword too, right? So we, in, in fact, uh, it's, it's part of the armor of God, right? 
Jeremiah 31, 16 and 17. Again, this is out of Good News Translation. It says, stop your crying and wipe away your tears. All that you have done for your children will not go unrewarded. They will return from the enemy's land. There is hope for your future. Your children will come back home. I, the Lord, have spoken. Man, I love that. Take that. Declare that over your kids. God, you said my kids will come home. You declared it by you are still, you're speaking, you're alive, you're on the throne. The God on the throne declared that this, the things that I've done, the truth that I have given them is not going to go unrewarded. They will return from the enemy's camp. They will come home. You spoke it. What about Isaiah 44, 3 through 5? For I will pour out water to quench your thirst and to irrigate your parched fields. And I will pour out my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your children. They will thrive. This, you, I will pour out my blessing on your children. They will thrive like watered grass, like willows on a riverbank. Some will proudly claim, I belong to the Lord. Others will say, I'm a descendant of Jacob. And some will write the Lord's name on their hands and will take the name of Israel as their own. Now we know that that comes through the cross and we're part of that. We're considered like Israel. Because that's God's chosen people. And that's the church today. My kids, Lord, I declare my kids blessing they will thrive like watered like watered grass like willows on a river bank god you said it they'll proudly proclaim that they belong to the lord isaiah 49 25 but thus says the lord even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away for the prey of the terrible is delivered I, i'm going to start this over because this is so stinking powerful God is declaring this. The captives of the mighty shall be taken away. There are a lot of deceptions, a lot of trickery that is that appears to be, and it is, it's mighty in its bondage. It's mighty in its strength. But he says, God is declaring this. Those captives of that mighty thing it is they're going to be taken away. Those captives will be taken away. The prey of the terrible will be delivered. That mighty entity, that demonic stronghold, that deception, that lie, that, oh, the grass is greener on the other side, and I'm just going to go over there. That deception is mighty, but it's terrible, and, it, and, it, and it's taken prey. And that prey has been bound. They're in bondage to an the, the, uh, a, an addiction of some kind or they're, you know, whatever, they're, they've walked away from God, they're bound by some philosophy or whatever it is. He says, for I will, I will contend with him who contends with you. Who contends with you? Satan? Leland talked about it. The enemy contends with you. God doesn't contend with you. The enemy does. And so God says, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible will be delivered. For I contend with those who contends with you and I will save your children. <sighs> Boy, that's as good as it gets. Declare the word of God over your kids. Not just the... the pro so... So we remind God, not because he forgot, but because it's his promise, it's his word, it activates faith in we, me, it activates hope in me, I can trust in him. If I don't have his word, what do I have? I have everything else to try to stand on, and it's all sand. But if I have the word and I have something solid, then I can go. To, now, I'm not saying this is the get, the get rich scheme that's going to happen overnight no you might you might stand and declare for a year or two or five or ten it doesn't even matter there's an eternity waiting so we declare his word we remind him of his promises for our children now to broaden it a little bit what if you're in financial difficulty? What if you have a bad doctor's report? What if you have, the list goes on and on and on and on. This is a principle 
That's why I started by saying this is a principle of prayer that's bigger than just our children. Because no matter what it is you face, we, we want to declare His Word because His Word cultivates faith Faith comes alive and pleases him, and he is bound by his character to reward. It's not in our time. It's not in our timing. That's never, that wasn't part of any of these scriptures. God, you have to do it in my time. We, we put these expectations on God in the area of timing, uh, well, I'll just say this. I'll, I'll leave it at this. Worship team can come up, and we'll close with a song. Is that um, <clears throat> we we want to use what He has planted in us and given us. We want that to come alive, and we want that to please Him. And 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 He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And I know. I know people have a will in the way of they go and they do their own thing and they may, they're making their own choices. I don't know of a scripture that really says that their will is stronger and mightier than the word of the living God. And so if, if I take my hope in declaring his word technically what i'm declaring is more it has more greater strength than their desire to make their own terrible decisions and choices let the word of god come alive let it come alive over people in your family over your kids let it come alive over the medical report let it come alive over these there there is no uh, there's no report greater than God's report. And so uh, I'll just close with a prayer here and then we'll do some worship. But I, I, I want to pray for I want to pray for families that uh, you know if that's where God let this thing come alive in me was a testimony, a 25 year old testimony. Uh, and so I know that it was it's sensitive children were sensitive to Jesus Jesus was sensitive to children I should say and he's still sensitive to children it it wasn't seasonal and so father I come before you God and and I pray Lord every person here Lord if they're standing in that place where they have a son or a daughter Lord, that, uh, that is not walking in the fullness of who you've called them to be. Lord, I pray over them and I pray over their, their kids in Jesus' name, Lord. God, we, we cast our cares on you. You know every situation. You know the, the reasoning. You know the lure, the draw to the world. To, to whatever, the lifestyle. You, you know what, what is luring them away. It's the enemy. But God, we take joy in, in throwing a little dynamite now and then. God, by declaring your word over our kids, Lord, you said that you would save them. You said they re would return from the enemy's camp. God, you said that you would bless them. God, you said that our efforts would not go unrewarded. And Lord, you, the creator of the universe, when he declares something, when he declared, let there be light, guess what happened? There was light. Lord, when your word goes forth, everything adjusts. There is a demand on creation to honor the word of the living God. And you said that our children would return from the enemy's camp that you would go in and save them god that they would proudly declare that they are one of yours god i pray in jesus name for for our kids that lord that they would rise to where you've called them to be god 
And, and that is to, to boldly declare that they are one of yours, Lord. So I pray for every single kid, God, that there would be something, faith would begin to come alive because of the word we're speaking over them. Faith would come alive. Lord, hope would come alive. And God, that they would return from the enemy's camp. God, you, you sent angels right into the middle of the most wicked city on the planet to save Lot. Would you not send an angel down to save our kids? I believe you would. Lord, you're no respecter of persons. Lot wasn't some great, great man that... God, you, you're no respecter of persons. If you've done it once, you'll do it again. Except the flood. But God, you're in the saving business. You're in the reconciling business. You sent your son so that man could be reconciled. God, at what, what part of your heart is not to reach out if faith would come alive in our lives, in our hearts? So God, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. And God, I, I expect good results. Why? Because, well, the word of God says it. Not because I'm bold in something that I shouldn't be. God, but I expect for your word to come to pass. It, the, the whole Bible started with your word coming to pass. And you begin to create, you begin to move, you begin to flourish the things on the earth, God, all by your word. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word over our children that we've declared this morning, God. And we, we praise you, God, that they will be like watered grass. They will be rich in color, rich in life, rich in blossoms and fruit. God, because your word has declared it, Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with a worship song.
God, I pray blessings on your church, God. God, Lord, I pray that we would walk in power, walk in faith this week. God, that we would walk in faith, trusting and standing on your word. Lord, for all the areas in our life, Lord. God, we declare, Lord, that, that your word, Lord, it rules over these areas in our life. And God, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're all dismissed.